Hello everyone and welcome back. In the last session, we have discussed about Minikube and uh, KubeCTL. So we looked at how we can set up a Kubernetes cluster locally using Minikube. And once the cluster is ready, we need to interact with the cluster and this is where we can make use of your kubectl. So kubectl is the command line tool that we can use to uh, basically interact with the cluster, create the resources, get information about the resources, um, among other things. Now in today's session, we are going to talk about Kubernetes control plane. Once again, before I start off with the session, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So grab your notebook and let's get started with this. So we know that Kubernetes is open source and what that means is we can run Kubernetes anywhere we want. So we can run it on the local machine to orchestrate containers on your laptop. We can run Kubernetes in an on-prem data center or we can also run Kubernetes in the cloud. But no matter where you choose to run Kubernetes, there is one thing in common, uh, you know, irrespective of where you decide to run your Kubernetes, and that is you will need to create and manage a control plane as part of your Kubernetes cluster. So control plane is where all the activities takes place and without a control plane, you cannot have a Kubernetes cluster. Now what this means is you will need to set up a number of machines that are running the control plane components and we will have to make sure that these control planes are highly available, uh, they are secure, they are scaled and also patched when there are new updates that are available. And because of all these things, managing the control plane can become quite a complex task. If you decide that you want to run the control plane on machines or anywhere you want, there are so many things that you will need to take care and that can become a very complex task uh, in terms of managing the um, uh, control plane. And for that very reason, AWS launched this uh, service, which is your Elastic Kubernetes service, or also known as EKS. Now, this helps us to take care of all these tasks efficiently. So the tasks that we discussed in the previous slide, all those tasks can be managed very efficiently. So EKS is a fully managed Kubernetes service from AWS, and this provides us with a managed control plane. So you don't have to worry about managing the control plane, AWS will provide that. So the advantage of having a managed control plane is that it removes a significant operational burden from you and it also allows you to focus on building your applications rather than focusing on managing the infrastructure for running the cluster. So how does this work? Let's go behind the scenes and have a look. So uh, to begin with this, first we will choose a region. So let's say uh, we are going with North Virginia, US East one. And then within this region, there are multiple isolated uh, locations known as your availability zones. And EKS will deploy the infrastructure that is used to run uh, the control plane within these availability zones. Now specifically, it will create three EC2 instances and this will become the Kubernetes control plane. Now this will install your components like your API server, the scheduler, uh, controllers and some other components. So in each of your uh, control plane, all these components will be installed. Now EKS will also create uh, three EC2 instances um, and this will be used to run the ETCD. Now ETCD is a distributed key value data store um, that the control plane is used to store the information about the state of the cluster. So your control plane will make use of this etcd to store all the information related to the cluster and all this information will be stored in the key value pair so as you can see here the instances that form the control plane they are spread across your multiple availability zone so this gives you the high availability built in so even if let's say this uh, instance goes down i still have other instances and that makes it highly available and if any of these components becomes unhealthy or fail, EKS will automatically detect this and it will replace the instances or you know, utilize the other instances that are available. So Amazon EKS will also scale these instances for you based on the load and it will be responsible for uh, security patches, updating the control plane components. 
Now the control plane that we have here, it's single tenant. So it's created for you to run your cluster. This will not be shared with any other AWS accounts and it does not manage anybody else's cluster. All of this is actually abstracted away from you. So all of these uh, features, the complex task of running your control plane, everything will be managed by AWS. That is where it provides you with the uh, managed control plane. So as a user, I can see that I have my EKS control plane over here. Now I can connect to its endpoint and also I can issue commands and gain information about the cluster and also the state of the cluster. I can update the settings, I can configure the settings, but as far as I'm aware, the underlying implementation of the actual control plane itself is invisible to me. Of course, a real life Kubernetes cluster is more than just a control plane. We need a data plane as well that will be controlled by the control plane. And this is so we can actually have a place to run our containers on. So generally when we talk about our clusters, we'll have the control plane and we'll also have our worker nodes, which will be considered as our data plane. So this control plane and your worker nodes together makes up for your cluster. And worker nodes is where we will be actually running our containers. Now again, this data plane, it consists of your nodes. So which are nothing but just machines that are running your Kubernetes components on them. So when we talk about the components, we have the container runtime, uh, which is responsible for actually running the containers. We will have the kubelet, which is responsible for making sure that the containers are healthy. And then we have the kube proxy, which maintains network rules and allows you to communicate with your pods. Now in AWS, it often makes sense to make use of EC2 instances. And if you use EC2 instances with your EKS cluster, your cluster may look something like this. So you'll have your availability zones, you'll have your control plane, you'll have the ETCD, and then you'll have your worker node. So this is how your cluster will look like. So as you can see, I've got a number of EC2 instances across multiple availability zones uh, forming my data plane. I could have just one EC2 instance and they could all be in one availability zone. Now that is that is completely up to you and it's completely configurable. Uh, I could also configure scaling so that I, I automatically add and remove nodes based on the number of pods that I want to run at that given point in time. So this, we are distributing the instances if you want to make the cluster highly available. You can put all the components, all the EC2 instances in one availability zone that also works. So it totally depends on your use case, how you wanna set it up. Now, there's no need to go to EC2 manually to create your instances. Uh, there's no need to manually install the Kubernetes components, the container runtime, the kubelets, the kube proxy on an EC2 instance, and then register it with your EKS. All of this can be done by EKS itself. In fact, there are three different types of node groups that EKS works with. So the first one we have is the managed node groups. This means you don't have to separately provision or register your EC2 instances with the Kubernetes control plane. EKS will create, update and terminate the instances for you. And essentially when you're doing this, you just have to choose the instance type that you want for your EC2 instances and EKS will be responsible for the operating system on that instance and for creating and managing that instance for you, right? So uh, under your managed node groups, we just have to specify the instance type and uh, your EKS will take care of provisioning those instances, uh, uh, choosing the AMIs, everything will be taken care by EKS. Now, this is still an EC2 instance that's in your account that uh, you see EKS has created for you and EKS will be responsible for the life cycle of these instances. Now, alternatively, if you need more control over the instances in your data plane, then you might choose to go with your self-managed node. So with your managed node groups, you don't have the control over the instances. That is something managed by EKS. But if you feel like, no, I want to have control over the instances, then you can go with your self-managed nodes. Now, this means that you will be responsible for creating and maintaining the instances. You will need to choose the instance type and you will need to choose the AMI as well to launch your instances. So under your self-managed nodes, you are trading simplicity with more control. So under this, you'll get more control over your instances. 
So with your managed or node groups, you'll have a lot of simplicity, but you don't have as much control, particularly over the operating system as you do with your self-managed node groups. Now we also have a third option in eCase, which is your Fargate. Now Fargate is a serverless compute engine, and this provides us with on-demand right-sized compute capacity for containers. And with Fargate, you no longer have to provision or configure these machines at all. Essentially, you define how much CPU you want and how much of memory you need for your pods and Fargate will handle the rest of the things for you. Now, this option gives you the lowest overhead compared to the other options we have. Now, with EKS, you can choose to run multiple different types of node groups all at the same time. So, you can choose to run a uh, managed node group as well as your self-managed nodes along with your Fargate as well. For example, you might choose to run most of your pods on Fargate for uh, simplicity. But then some of your pods might have a different requirement where you need to choose a particular operating system or where you need extra control over the instance itself. So you can choose to run those pods in the self-managed nodes or you can choose to run those pods in the managed node groups. And so you might run these pods in the same cluster, but then in different groups. Now, as an administrator, you need some way of connecting to this control plane. And then you want to issue commands about what pods you want to run and where you want to run them and what you want your data plane to be doing. Uh, maybe scaling up, scaling down, deleting the nodes, adding the nodes. And to do that, you can connect your cluster using a DNS name that your EKS provides. Now, this would give you an entry point to your API server and you can use this to send commands to your control plane and get information about what's actually happening within the cluster. You could use kubectl, which is your command line tool for Kubernetes to do this, or you might choose to go into the AWS console and use the graphical user interface there. So to summarize this session, we have seen how EKS provides with you with a managed control plane. You no longer need to create and set up the infrastructure to run your control plane on. It's all abstracted away from you in a highly scalable, uh, available and secure manner. We have also seen the different options you have for running your uh, data plane. So you have the self-managed node groups, you have the managed node groups, and then the serverless Fargate compute layer. That's all I have for this session. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more content and share it with your circle. Uh, if you have any feedback, then please leave it in the comments section below. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.